Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current patrons, supporters, and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So I'll push you the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we are leveraging the idea of optimal distribution fitting, in particular the Johnson's SU distribution, to perform advanced option valuation in Python, that is to value not only conventional calls and puts, but also exotic barrier options, such as uh, down and in or down and out puts or up and in and up and out calls, as well as compare our option fair values with real world option prices extracted from the Yahoo Finance option chain. We will use the logic of Monte Carlo simulation, but perform it not with the conventional normal distribution, but with the Johnson's SU distribution function that has been designed with portfolio management and option valuation in mind explicitly. We have got a separate tutorial which goes through the distribution fitting specifically, but I'll um, quickly recap what's going on here as we'll use the parameters of the Johnson SU function to perform Monte Carlo simulations just in a second. Our packages that we need are quite standard. NumPy and Pandas to work with arrays and data frames respectively. Uh, the Y Finance package allows us to access real world market data from Yahoo Finance. SciPy stats allows us to perform uh, statistical functions quite efficiently. SciPy optimize is just used for the maximum likelihood uh, estimation of Johnson's SU function parameters. And we also visualize a bunch of data using graphs, so Matplotlib PyPlot is handy. Having imported the packages, we can quickly go through the distribution fitting code. First, we specify what is the underline for our um, option trading. And um, I just selected Apple. We'll play around with this ticket towards the end of the tutorial. What is crucial is that as Yahoo Finance only allows you to look at the current option chain, doesn't allow you to backtrack, the end date for your stock price retrieval should be the most current trading day. And uh, as we are currently at the 13th of March, which is a Monday, I specified it over here, uh, 2023, uh, March the 13th. And I selected to go five years back for our distribution fitting purposes. So from the 13th of March, 2018 to the 13th of March, 2023. And uh, this is the date format that Yahoo Finance understands the best, which is a string with a four digit um, year, two digit month and two digit date uh, separated by hyphens. Then we retrieve the closing prices using the Yahoo Finance download command. Then we calculate the returns and sort them to perform distribution fitting, calculate the empirical distribution function and optimize our theoretical cumulative distribution function as in Johnson's SU. For that, we calculate mean and standard deviation. Those will be the starting values for our uh, location and scale parameters that govern the X variable, which scale the returns. And as starting values for our hyperbolic sign function, the second set of location and scale parameters uh, over here, we use zero and one. They'll converge to the optimal values through maximum likelihood. For that, we define a function that returns uh, negative log likelihood. Well, that's because the scipy optimize function can only minimize functions. So we minimize something negative. It's equivalent to maximizing something positive. So at the end, we'll maximize log likelihood just as needed. And uh, our vector of parameters, the list of parameters um, is the list of four location and scale parameters, two location and two scale. After we have optimized, and again, here we use Nelda Mead because our function is reasonably smooth and we have got not too many parameters, only four, uh, we then can retrieve our optimal location and scale parameters for the Johnson SU function. And then just to check how well it uh, describes real world distribution of Apple returns, we calculate the cumulative distribution function, plot it and evaluate the goodness of it using a basic kolmogorov smirnov test. Again, if you're interested in this distribution fitting code, we have got uh, a Python tutorial on it separately. Or if you're interested in the mathematical fundamentals behind the Johnson SU function, we have got an Excel tutorial on that as well. However, here, let's just run the code. 
verify that the Johnson SU function uh, describes returns of Apple remarkably well. The p-value is in excess of 80%. The goodness of it is uh, quite amazing. And we can even see it graphically, the uh, smooth orange theoretical function does um, almost completely overlap with the empirical distribution function in blue. We can see some um, discrepancy, but it's very small, and that's highlighted in the uh, high p-value of the Golden Girls Murnoff test. So the deviation from the Johnson SU function is uh, minimal. And that would allow us to use the parameters of the Johnson SU function to generate random returns from this distribution. But first, let's retrieve uh, the real-world option book for our uh, underline, which is Apple. For that, we can use the ticker and input our ticker, which is Apple, inside, and refer to the option chain method. And uh, as the argument here, we can select the expiry date. If we do not specify it, by default, it will return uh, the one that um, will mature the earliest. And again, here it's important to know some conventions in option trading. Uh, it's the third Friday of each month when uh, stock options expire. And here we have got 2023, March 17th. The 17th of March is the third Friday of March 2023. That's perhaps not ideal for us as it's just five trading days left until March 17th. So let's specify a different expiry date, let's say in April. Let's say 2023, April, and the third Friday of April will be the 21st. So if we specify it this way, we can see that now the expiry is changed to 2023, April 04, 21st. And we see some relevant um, data with regards to these option contracts. We can see the strikes sorted in ascending order and their premium. However, perhaps uh, a more intuitive um, representation of that would be to separate calls and puts into separate data frames. So let's say options is the variable that's equal to this data retrieval. Calls is options calls and puts is options puts. And now we can actually have a look at the data frame. For example, for calls, we'll see strikes and last prices. Ideally, we would need bids and asks to model option strategies and take into account of the bid-ask spread. However, as the US market is not yet open, it's uh, not even 11 a.m. Uh, in the UK, and the um, US markets open quite a bit later, bids and asks are unavailable. But we can always use last prices here as a reasonably good approximation. However, do keep in mind that those might be uh, quite far away from uh, outstanding uh, limit orders that you would uh, ultimately satisfy if you want to trade options uh, right now. Uh, we could also see how um, recently or how remotely the last trade was for these options and we can see those are uh, last traded uh, on Friday, so quite a long time ago. This option, for example, was even traded uh, at the end of February, which is very remote, but that's unsurprising given how deep in the money those options are. If we have a look at something that's a little bit closer to the uh, at the money strike, to the current price of the underline, we'll see that those were traded uh, quite recently at the near the market close uh, on Friday. Again, to verify what's the center price, we can have a look at the most recent price, and it's 148 uh, and a half dollars per share, which means that the center price that we'll use is 150. Again, it's quite uh, um, conventional uh, to have strikes uh, that go in steps and represent next round numbers. So we'll have a step of five here. You can um, buy or sell a call report at 140, 145, 150. That uh, um, generates enough flexibility, but also allows each of these markets for each of these strikes to be um, sufficiently liquid. Uh, now let's visualize our uh, pricing for calls and puts. So let's use the PLT plot function and uh, let's uh, uh, plot our strikes alongside the relevant option premium. So calls strike, calls last price, and the same for puts.
and that plots the values of calls and puts respectively. We can see that the prices of puts increase with the strike quite uh, um, intuitively, as it's more valuable to be able to sell something at a higher strike than otherwise. And the market prices of puts go down with the strike, as it's more valuable to buy something at a cheaper price than otherwise. And we can see um, a nice intersection uh, between the prices of calls and puts uh, at around uh, the center strike, which is also quite intuitive. And now, to actually uh, perform the Monte Carlo valuation, we'll need to specify our seed. For that, we'll need to know the maturity, so how many uh, days do we need to simulate for in each of the simulations. And again, given that there are around six weeks remaining until the 21st of uh, April 2023, that's the expiry date we've chosen. Let's select around 30, six trading weeks, 30 trading days, quite standard. Please seek to vary this parameter given your circumstances, given uh, the maturity of your options of interest. And we'll also need to specify the number of simulations. So let's say n sim, number of simulations, is a thousand. That would allow us to visualize the random walk still, uh, but also allow us enough precision. Again, uh, if you would like a very precise simulation, seek to increase this number of simulation to 10,000 or maybe 100,000 even. The code is efficient enough to handle that. But we'll stick with uh, 1,000 simulations for now. And now for our C, we use the numpy random random function and specify the dimension, which would be maturity and sim. So we'll generate basically a random data frame with uh, those dimensions, a random matrix, if you will. And if we return the seed, we'll see that those are all random numbers distributed between zero and one, with the ideal to plug into our Johnson SU quantile function. So let's do just that and calculate our simulated returns using the uh, logic of the Johnson SU quantile function or percentile point function. So SU location one plus SU scale one times the uh, hyperbolic sign function, which is available in the NumPy package. It's called quite uh, intuitively. And inside we specify the inverse um, normal distribution. So SPS norm PPF, percentage point function of our seed minus the second location parameter of the Johnson SU function divided by the second scale parameter of the Johnson SU function. And that allows us to construct our simulated returns. And as we refer to them, we'll be able to see um, the dimension or the scale at least of those returns. And they are arranged um, as a, a two dimensional array, which is basically a matrix. We'll be able to treat it as a data frame later on when we simulate the prices. So our simulated prices, well, we always start with our most recent price, which is prices minus one, uh, $148.5 per share. As we remember, again, just to verify, prices minus one is indeed $148.5. That is what informed our uh, center price of 150. That's the closest strike available. And then we times it by the data frame of one plus our simulated returns. We use the comprod command here to calculate cumulative products of one plus simulated returns, which would allow us to quite naturally calculate all of the simulated prices one after the other. And now we can actually plot those random walks, plot our simulated prices, And that provides a very uh, familiar picture to uh, anyone who has ever done uh, any random walk visualization. We start um, close to the uh, current um, underlying price at 148.5. Again, the first spread is due to the return in the first trading day. And then we have got a nice dispersion of those simulations. Again, that's why we selected a thousand. A thousand graphs can still be put on a chart. Again, you can see that it has taken quite a bit of time to plot all of it. Uh, but if we reduce the number of simulations to, let's say, 50, this 
chart would look even um, nicer, look uh, even less uh, cluttered. However, let's persist with a thousand for now. That would allow reasonable precision in our evaluation. And uh, finally, we need to calculate our uh, relevant uh, price metrics that would be uh, useful in retrieving the payoffs of our barrier options, of our conventional options, uh, as well as to make sure that uh, we have correctly identified whether a barrier has been reached or not. So we'll need the max price, which is just the maximum of the simulated prices, the min price, which is just a minimum of the simulated prices, as well as the price of expiry, which is the uh, final row of the simulated prices data frame. So we use the iloc command here, index location, minus one, the most um, recent, the final one. And again, just to verify, sim prices is indeed a data frame. Uh, each row is a day. For example, this is the first simulation. We started 147, and then it drops to 130.42 at the end. And that allows us to correctly treat the dimensionality of our data. And now let's specify the characteristics of our options. Again, let's say that our strike is 150. Again, the center strike will be able to play around with it later. Uh, let's say our barrier up, which would be relevant for our calls, our up and in and up and out calls is 170, and the barrier down is 130. And the final feature that we need to uh, specify is the risk free rate. And uh, right now it is around 4.7% in the US, so let's input just that 4.7% or 0.047. And now we can calculate our option payoffs and their fair values as averages appropriately discounted using the relevant risk free rate. So our up and in payoff would be equal to first, we need to take into account whether the option is active, and it only activates if max prices are greater than or equal to the up barrier. That's the only uh, condition that activates our up and in call. Again, we need to make sure that we correctly take into account the activation, even if the price at expiry is lower than the barrier, but the barrier has been reached during the lifetime of the option, the option will still be active. And then we implement the logic of the gross payoff of the call option, which is the NumPy maximum of zero and the difference between price at expiry and uh, the strike, as if the option is active and our price at expiry is greater than the strike, we can buy at the strike, exercise our option, and sell it at the market price, which is price at expiry, and take in the difference as our gross profit. Now we can modify it for the up and out payoff, and here the option will be deactivated if the up barrier has been crossed in any capacity during the lifetime of the option, and that's the only uh, change we need to make here. For the down and in option, as it's a port and it uses the down barrier, we need to make sure that the minimum price is less than or equal to the down barrier. And also, as it's a put option, we seek to buy at the market price, which is proxied by the price at expiry, and sell at the strike if it's beneficial to us. This is what this NumPy maximum function accounts for. And for the down and out payoff, we'll need to take into account that it's only active if the down barrier has not been breached, which means that it's only active if the minimum price is greater than the down barrier. And it remains a put option, so this gross payoff logic remains intact. And now, to better understand the payoff structures of those options, we can visualize them. Instead of a plot, because the uh, prices at expiry are not sorted, I'll use a scatter, and I'll plot price at expiry alongside, let's say, the up and in payoff. And here we see that for the up and in payoff, we have got some uh, simulations where the price at expiry is not 170 or above, which is the condition for it to be active, 
but there is still a positive payoff. That's due to the fact that the price has reached 170 at some point, activated the option and then retracted back. So we could still activate it because uh, it was first beneficial to us. The price is higher than 150. Uh, however, we have missed some of the upside because we haven't exercised that option when it just activated at 170. So for the up and out, we'll see that the option is um, exercised only if the price is um, lower than the up barrier of 170. This line uh, verifies it. And we still have got some unlikely coincidences when even though the price at expiry is lower than 170, the 170 barrier has been breached during the lifetime of the option and therefore our up and out call is inactive at expiry and delivers us zero gross payoff. For the down and out put, the logic will be very similar. Again, it's only uh, until 130 when we receive the payoff and even if the price is above 130 but the barrier has been breached, we receive nothing. And for the down and in, we'll see a picture that's symmetric to the, our up and in call, just in the direction of decreasing underlying prices, with uh, some uh, instances where the expiry uh, price is above 130, still being uh, eligible because the uh, barrier has been breached during the lifetime of the option. And uh, now we can calculate the fair values, which just will be the averages of those payoffs appropriately discounted. So for the up and in value, we need to calculate the NumPy average of the up and in payoff and discounted it by one plus the risk free rate raised to the power of maturity in days divided by 252, as that's an annual risk free rate and there are 252 trading days in a year approximately, at least in the US. And now, as we copy it, we'll be able to estimate the values for the up and out, for the down and in, and for the down and out. These are the only changes that we need to make here. And now let's uh, write some description, a simple expert system that will um, produce an interpretation of the um, values that we have uh, just calculated. Say print the fair value of the up and in call equals, we will call at strike and then we put string of the strike. and barrier put the string of the up barrier equals and then we refer to the string of the rounded up and in value to two decimals and then we put a full stop at the end just for good measure and we can copy that and replicate it for our up and out call, up and out value, down and in put, down and in value and the down barrier, and then and out put. You can see how simple it is to adapt our uh, expert system to interpret all four of our fair values. We can see that it produces a, an interpretation and rounds the uh, fair values to two decimals, which is what uh, real world option prices uh, are. And now we can use the heuristic that the uh, values of up and in call and up and out call add up to a value of a normal call uh, without any barriers, a non-exotic uh, call option basically, and compare it to the real world uh, market price. So call value equals our up and in value plus our up and out value. 
and the put value is our down and in value plus the down and uh, out value. And uh, we can also retrieve the prices. The call price is the calls um, data frame. We refer to that. We refer to the strike. It needed to be equal to the strike that we've got. Again, here we need to make sure that there is um, an option available at the market at the strike that we care about. And we refer to the last price of this call. However, if we retrieve the call price this way, it will not be a number, it will be um, an item from the data frame. So let's just use float to make it uh, a number that we can use for comparisons. And let's do the same for the put price. Changing calls into puts where appropriate. That, if we just double check, will get our put price, for example, as a number. So now we can print the fair value of the call at strike, and then also refer to the string of the strike, equals the string of the rounded call value to two decimals. And then we write a simple condition if um, our call value is greater than the call price, then we need to specify that the call is uh, undervalued. The call available, the call option available at the market is undervalued at, and then we return the call price. Of the case, we specify that it is overvalued. And then we do exactly the same procedure for the puts. As we can see, the fair value of the call is 8.98 and uh, the call option at the market is undervalued. The price is lower than the fair value of the option. And for the put option, it's the reverse. The price of the put option is 6.25, which is quite a bit higher than 5.18 that we've got. However, the Johnson SU function has produced uh, option premia that are very um, consistent in terms of the magnitude with the market prices and what it might hint at is that the market believes that Apple price is likely to go down as calls are undervalued and puts are overvalued if we're using the historical Johnson's SU distribution function. However, we can also check for different strikes. Let's say we move uh, somewhat in the money, going for 140 strike, 160, 120 barriers that would immediately um, calculate the updated uh, fair values and compare them to uh, relevant uh, market prices that it retrieves from the option chain. If we go out of the money, let's say 180 strike and uh, quite wide barriers, we'll be able to see um, a very similar picture with uh, calls undervalued and puts overvalued. However, the fair values um, staying roughly in line with the market prices. What is also quite um, useful is that, what we can also see is that the fair values of the up and out and uh, down and out options become quite small and even negligible. That's due to the fact that in a thousand simulations, it is unlikely that those barriers um, are breached. If we go for something um, deep out of the money, let's say a strike of 180, an up barrier of 240, and a down barrier of 120, we'll be able to see that our uh, option prices still are quite consistent with the market, with puts still 
overvalued and call still undervalued. And what we see is that the fair value, for example, of the up and in call is zero. That means that in none of our simulations, we actually had Apple price breach 240 as uh, our up barrier. That's quite intuitive from what we see over here. And uh, now let's try to customize our code and go for a different underline, let's say Walmart. We still see that uh, the Johnson SU distribution is very consistent with Walmart prices. We'll be able to see the uh, option prices available for Walmart. Let's verify what the most recent price is, 137. So let's check whether there is a call option available at 135, for example. Yes, there is. So we can proceed with our simulations, look at simulated Walmart prices. We can see that the um, deviation, the scatter, is a little bit smaller than the one we've seen for Apple, reflecting the fact that Walmart is a stabler stock. We refer to the strike price at 135, and let's say an up barrier of 150, and a down barrier of 120. And we can see how the logic of the model is replicated for a completely different stock um, instantly. Uh, what is important here is that the option uh, feature, the option chain for Yahoo Finance is only available for uh, US traded stocks. So unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to replicate it for um, stocks from any other markets. However, still, you've got hundreds of uh, various assets to play around with and to apply this Monte Carlo simulation framework too. Please do like a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm willing to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporters on Patreon. Thank you very much and stay tuned.